covenants and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. Good morning, Bethlehem Covenant Church. Thanks for joining us here on this Sunday, October 10th. Uh, hope you are doing well and that you've been having a, a good week. Wondering what kind of things you know God has been teaching you this week or uh, what are some of the things that you've been able to do. Uh, you know, sometimes the things, the tasks that God has for us aren't always the giant big things that we think or the big career path. It, it may be something within your week or a family member or a neighbor or something that you were able to help, that you were able to give to or pass on a little encouragement or pray for. Um, so we, who knows what it is for you. I was reminded this week uh, just how many uh, people are still struggling uh, with many different things, uh, work-related things, um, COVID-related things, health things, um, job things, yeah, like, and, and uh, family dynamics. And uh, so a lot of people going through a lot of stuff, and and we can always be lifting up one another in prayer. I, I really say this again to you as we start this service, that um, being a part of a church is more than just an attending thing. It is also caring for the rest of the people who God has connected you with at this time for a reason. And so be praying for your other uh, fellow church members and um, and also be reaching out to them maybe. Just how are you doing? If you know they just had a surgery or been going through something or an anniversary of some kind, reach out. Let them know you care. Think about it. Let God, by His Spirit, lead you to helping and connecting uh, with other people from the church. We need the church. Uh, in this season in our life, we need it even more uh, than before. So please reach out to them. A couple announcements as we begin. One is our BCW ladies are doing a quilt auction again. They always do it in October. It used to be quilts displayed in the back of our church. People would come and see it, but we found it even more effective to put it online. And so it is there. There's a link on your church email or on our Facebook page. You can see it and you can bid on those uh, quilts and we will get them to you. Um, or you can come and pick them up, whatever, um, when that auction is over. Um, we're also helping a couple of refugee families uh, that are moving into Lincoln and Omaha. And uh, we're collecting furniture items and household items that will be able to get them in their new apartments there when they come, which will be in the next couple of weeks. And so if you'd like to be a part of that and uh, have some items you can donate, please call me or Carla Kunkel, Tracy Hernandez, any one of us, uh, to let us know. And we will arrange a place to, to pick that up so we can get it to them. And then in two weeks... On October 24th, between 3 and 5 p.m., uh, over at the Cove in Waverly, we're going to have our fall festival and trunk or treat. And so we'll have a whole bunch of trunks there, cars there, uh, handing out candy to the kids. We're going to have a pie uh, contest. We're going to have a, a coffee and hot drinks uh, truck that's going to come and have those. Um, we have other kind of activities and just a chance to hang out together. 
So please mark that on your calendar and, and come and be with us. Uh, it'll be a good time. Bring the kids out. If you want to hand out candy from your car or something too, that would be great. Let us know and uh, we would love to have you uh, be, make it even more for the kids. Uh, so that is what we, we got going on. All right. I want to get us into our sermon now. Um, we are continuing on in our Old Testament study here. I'm taking us through the Old Testament in 15 weeks. Uh, the key stories that shape us and teach us about God and what he did. And I'll tell you, I love the Old Testament stories and how they encourage us uh, to have greater faith. Greater faith that God can and will do uh, what he has promised. Uh, we began our study with creation in Genesis 1. Then we looked at the fall. Then we looked at Noah and how he built an ark to save his family. And then we looked at Abraham and God's promise to Joseph and how God turned all those events in his life for good uh, to the call of Moses to last week when we looked at how God delivered his people out of bondage with the 10 plagues and how God showed he is Lord. Well, this morning we continue on in that study. God's people leave Egypt. They cross the Red Sea by a mighty display of God's power. God parts the waters for them. You've seen it on the movie Ten Commandments. You've read about it in Scripture, maybe since even as a Sunday schooler. God parts the sea uh, for them, and now they are free. Um, but the journey has just begun for God's people. They're free, but they're in the wilderness. You know, thank you, God, but now what are we going to do? We got the wilderness in front of us. You know, but here is the thing, and it's, it's a really interesting thing when you look at a map or when you actually journey it, if you, you know, is that the journey from, uh, to Canaan from Egypt is really only a couple weeks' walk. But it would take God's people 40 years. Because this will be a time when God's goal is not just to get them there, but to form them as a people along the way. You see, here's the thing. God rarely takes the shortest or the easiest path. Have you noticed that for us? We want it over as fast as possible. But God rarely takes the quickest or the path with the least struggle. No, God cares more about our forming than our comfort. And so Moses would lead God's people through the desert of Sinai for 40 years until they learn who God is and how to trust him. It's interesting to me that that God parts the waters to bring them out of Egypt and God will part the waters again to bring them into Canaan. The same miracle th uh, that brings Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea is the same miracle that would bring them across the Jordan River into Canaan. Uh, but the majority of these books, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, are what happens in the middle, the 40 years between the rivers. I was thinking about how the wilderness is often a metaphor for life and how the crossing of the Red Sea can be like our new birth and how God opened up a way for us in Christ to be saved. And the, the crossing of the Jordan River at the end is, is like when we pass from this life uh, to the next, into heaven, the promised land. But right now, and our life down here, is what happens between the rivers. It's, it's the time between accepting Christ and, and being a child of God, but growing and learning in Christ and being formed as God's people in the wilderness until we go and get to see him in the promised land. But the wilderness is also seen and referred to in the Bible as the trials that we have to go through. The Sinai and Judean wilderness is a vast desert. There is nothing there. I have been there. The wilderness is one of my favorite places to visit on our trips to Israel. It is so vast, so quiet, so barren, and it hasn't changed much in the thousand 
hundreds of years since the Bible. It's the one place that you can go and see today that isn't all touristy and looks just like it did when Moses walked it. And when you go out there, it's just you and God. It, it, it's, it's like you can hear God's voice a little clearer because everything else has just been stripped away and you're in this barren wilderness just with him. I had an experience in the Judean wilderness. I've told some of you this before, but I was by myself out there and decided to take a hike and I had only a small water bottle and I got out there and, and got into trouble. But coming to my aid was a young man on a donkey at just the right time. It was a miracle. It really was. He happened down my trail, a Bedouin teenager, and he gave me water and a ride out of the desert canyon where I was faint and back to safety. And, and so the wilderness in the Bible is often compared to the trials in life we got to go through and how God gets us through things. And before we get to the promised land, we have lessons we must learn along the way. And there are times in those trials where it seems long and we complain and we grumble like Israel did and we wonder how we're going to make it through and where are we going to get food and water and all these things. And and I'm speaking broader now about this. But, but maybe you have had to go through things in your life. Maybe you have found yourself a time or two in a desert place. And again, I'm speaking broader <laughs> where it's just you and God. And there are lessons that you must learn in those wilderness places. And to know that we serve a God who isn't just interested in the shortest and easiest path, but are forming in the middle of those times. Well, what I want to share today are the six things that I believe I see here in the scripture that God provided for his people when they were in that wilderness when they were in that desert place, those 40 years between the rivers. God gives his people six things they're going to need to get from point A to point B. Between leaving Egypt and entering the promised land, between being slaves and now truly becoming his children, that journey, God provides six things that I believe we now as Christians find in Christ and in our life and in our trials uh, that help us grow. Um, and so I want to share those with us. The first thing that I see that God provided for his people comes right away when they enter the desert. It's in Exodus 13, 20 to 22, um, where it says, After leaving Sokoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. The Lord was their light. The cloud of shade by day and the fire which lit their path at night. The first thing that God provides for us and, and did for them in the wilderness was his very presence with us, with his people. He doesn't leave them. He goes step by step with them through the wilderness. He doesn't remain at Mount Sinai and send them off on their own to go. He goes to the first amazing thing that God provides is his presence. He will be there. He won't abandon them in their time of need. He would shepherd them by cloud during the day that would cover them from the heat of the sun to the fire at night that would lead them through the darkness and show them the way. This is our Lord. The shade at our right hand. The lamp unto our feet. 
Deuteronomy 31.8 says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and don't be discouraged. God is with you. Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn or settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your right hand will hold me fast. So the first thing God provided was himself. They would never have to walk alone. I think of the disciples. After Jesus had been crucified but risen, and he was now going to ascend into heaven, and they were going to be left on earth. And they thought, how are we going to make it on our own? But the Lord appeared to them and repeated basically the words of Deuteronomy and told them in Matthew 28, I will be with you always to the end of the age. And the Lord would be with them through the giving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our cloud and fire. He lives in every believer, every day. He is the presence of God with us until heaven. He is our shade and our comfort, but also our guide, our counselor, speaker of truth. In some churches, they have a candle uh, that is lit, that is called the eternal flame, that is always lit day or night in their sanctuary. And it's like the one that was in the old tabernacle or the temple of the Jews back in Bible times. A light that is always on to remind the people that the presence of the Lord is always with them. Psalm 121 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord will keep you from harm. He'll watch over your life, your coming and going until now and forevermore. May we be more aware of God's presence every day of our life. The second thing, though, God provided for his people in the wilderness was daily bread. Exodus 16, 2 through 5 says, In the desert, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you brought us out into this desert to starve to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they're to prepare what they bring in, that it be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So the second thing God provides is he rained down bread for people to eat. And that bread was there for them faithfully every morning. Just like God's mercies are with us every morning. The people would wake up and, and a flaky substance would be on the desert floor just outside their tents. And they didn't know what it was. And so they called it manna, which means what is it? But it was bread from heaven. It was how God would provide for them and sustain them when there was no food. Now they would eventually get tired of it, the same thing every day. But it filled their bellies, did what it was supposed to do. Sustain them in the wilderness. God was waiting on the feast until the promised land. For now, he would just give them what they needed. And it wasn't just food, but it was also a test. For they had to trust him to bring it every day. You know, each Sunday, we pray the Lord's Prayer. Which says, give us this day our daily bread. The Lord will provide for our family, and he will do it each day. In the desert, whenever the people tried to take more than a day's supply of manna and hoard it in baskets or in their pockets for fear that it wasn't going to be there the next day, the Lord, or the bread that they would save, would immediately go bad, and it would make them sick. God was trying to teach them to rely and to trust in him every day for their daily bread, and to go to sleep at night and not worry because tomorrow he'll provide for them again. Sometimes we want more than a day's supply. We want to be able to see so that we don't have to trust. God wants us to trust. The reason the people were to gather more on the sixth day 
was because the seventh was a Sabbath and they weren't to work. And so God provided them enough on the sixth day to cover the day of rest, which should teach us to obey God and honor the Sabbath, knowing that he will provide. I love how Jesus, who is God, made food appear for the hungry when he fed 5,000. But I also love how the next day when the people came looking for food again, Jesus took time to teach them about what they even more needed. More than even just food for their bellies. They needed his word. They needed him. And so he said, I am the true bread come down from heaven. To feed more than just your bellies, but your souls. We Christians, we believe in the daily bread and we call it sometimes God's word. Because we need this as much as we need food on the table. We need time spent with God every day to nourish our souls and give us energy for the work he has for us to do. He is our daily bread. The third thing God provided for his people in the wilderness was water. In Exodus 17, it says, The people were thirsty, grumbled against Moses, said, Why did you bring us out here to die of thirst? And they're always grumbling, always not trusting right away, having to learn that. Well, Moses cried to the Lord. The Lord answered. He told him to go in front of the people with his staff and take the elders too. And God said in verse 6 of chapter 17, I'll stand there before you by the rock of Oreb. Strike the rock and water will burst forth for you to drink. The Lord literally made streams in the desert. Water flowed from a rock. In another place, God turned bitter water into drinkable water. Water is essential, as we know, for life. I love the story of King Hezekiah in the Bible. And when Jerusalem was surrounded by attackers and he knew he and his people were in trouble because the only source of water was outside the city walls. But with God's help, the king and the people prayed and God showed them the way to dig tunnels underground to the source of water, and God sustained his people in the city. You know, water is something we take for granted because, you know, until we don't have it, we just turn on a tap and then water flows. We don't even think about it. But around the world, people need clean water, bitter water made pure, or digging wells so that they have it for their village. We as a church have been a part of some of these efforts to provide drinkable water to those in need, it's how God is working to still provide that. But thinking deeper, just like with the daily bread being his word, water is often a metaphor in scripture for the Lord. David wrote in Psalm 63, You, God, uh, are my God. Earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you, my whole body longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Your love is better than life. David in this verse isn't talking about literal water, but something that only the Lord can truly satisfy inside of him. A love that can only be filled by him. A joy that can only come from him. A peace that can only he provide that you can't find in this world. He is that which we thirst for. There's this great story of Jesus who met a Samaritan woman at the well in the afternoon as she came to draw water. It's in John chapter 4, and this woman had lived a hard life with many disappointments, and Jesus knew it. He's God. And so he sits down by the well, and he strikes up a conversation with this woman, and he asks her for a drink. And they talk a little, and then Jesus said, if you really knew who I was, you would ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water that will become in you like a spring of water that you will never thirst again. Jesus didn't mean that she would never have to go to the well for a drink again, but Jesus was talking about something deeper, satisfying that she had been looking for her whole life and hadn't been able to find. He was the answer to it. This woman didn't know God, didn't have a personal relationship with him, or know his love for her, or forgiveness, and her whole life she'd been searching in the wrong place for it. She'd suffered through five failed marriages, rejection, kept looking in all the wrong places in life for love, joy, and acceptance. 
the Lord wanted to give her living water to satisfy her soul. Jeremiah 2.13 says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. In this life and in the wilderness, we can look in all the wrong places for love, for hope, for peace. And in the end, it's like we've been drinking sand. We're thirsty still. There's only one who can truly satisfy us who can take the thirst away, who can provide the living water, streams in the desert. And that is Jesus. The fourth thing God provided for his people in the wilderness was victory and protection. The wilderness was a place where God's people were vulnerable. They don't have any army or stone wall to hide behind. The Lord had to be their refuge, fortress, and shield. And so we read in Exodus 17, 8, and 9, the Amalekites come and attack the Israelites. And so Moses says to Joshua, come, choose some men and go out and fight them. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And verse 11 says that as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. So when Moses' arms got tired, they put stones underneath and Aaron and Ur helped hold up Moses' arms steady until sunset and God's people got the victory. And afterward, the Lord told Moses to remember this. And so Moses made an altar to the Lord, called it, The Lord is my banner, my refuge. God protected his people. He was a shield about him, a mighty fortress. Moses lifting up his staff during battle was like us lifting up our prayers for one another to God. It's holding one another up in prayer. Knowing that victory is coming by God. Not by us. The battle belongs to the Lord. We read in the New Testament. How Paul called his people to pray at all times. And put on the full armor of God every day. To take their stand against the devil's schemes. And, and I have had to learn that even like we see here. Moses needed somebody to help lift his arms. He couldn't do it by himself. He got tired. And we all need people to help us be strong. We all need prayer. We all need each other. Before coming to Nebraska, I pastored in Alberta, Canada. And I'm still connected to our friends there. And one of the daughters of the congregation, who was only a high schooler when we first moved up there 20-some years ago, is now in her 30s. And she has had to go through many tough things in life already. Well, now her husband is sick with cancer that has worked its way into his liver. And it has gotten very serious. And so the church did this great thing. They set up a 24-hour prayer vigil for them and their four little kids. And each person in the congregation took a half hour and committed to prayer, even through the night. Someone from that church was praying every minute of the day and the night. They were lifting each other up. God has given us this in the storms of life in the wilderness places. In Christ, we are invited to come to him and call on him and know that he hears us. He intercedes for us. He has given us this promise. He answers prayer. The Lord is our banner. What a gift prayer is and what a gift community is. Like Aaron and Ur lifted up the arms of Moses when he got weak. What peace we often form it because we don't share our needs with one another and go to God in prayer together. He alone can help us. Humble yourself and ask for prayer. Talk to somebody else. Be with them. Put them and their needs ahead of your own and pray for them. We all need each other in wilderness and in prayer. The fifth thing God provided for his people was his law. In Exodus 19, they make it to Mount Sinai and Moses goes up the mountain to meet with God. And, and God said in Exodus 19, 5, Now if you obey me fully, keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you'll be my treasured possession. And then in Exodus 20, God gave Moses ten commandments on two stone tablets. 
And God gave additional laws for them to obey him and how to treat one another. And these holy, perfect, eternal commands of God were not like anything the world has ed had ever heard or seen. They were from God, not man. They revealed the heart of who God is and his will for us. And in them we see our own sin, because his perfect law reveals our own sinfulness and wickedness, because we often want to do the opposite. The Ten Commandments are, to have no other gods before him, to not make an idol of anything, to not misuse his name, to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, to honor our father and mother, to not murder, to not commit adultery, to not steal, to not lie, to not covet. These commands are for all time, but we often break them every day. God's people broke his commands before Moses even came down the mountain. They had already made an idol, a golden calf they began to worship. The commands of God reveal our sin and our need for a savior and a righteousness that can only come by faith. Jesus fulfilled the law. He did what we couldn't. And he saved us from our sin and he gave us the Holy Spirit who would daily remind us of God's word and will and help give us strength to live it when we can't. Jesus also taught us that the heart of these commands that God gives is love. To love God and love others. Which Jesus says doesn't dismiss the commands, it just reveals their heart. For if we truly loved God, we wouldn't worship another. We wouldn't misuse his name. We wouldn't put other things above him. If we truly loved one another, we would honor our father and mother. We wouldn't murder. We wouldn't cheat. We wouldn't lie. We wouldn't steal. At the heart of the commands Jesus taught is love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my teaching. So in, in the wilderness, just like in life, God shows us the path. He gives us the law. We are to learn how to obey God and to follow Christ and to do what he says. This will guide us in the wilderness. Sometimes we've gotten into the wilderness because we have gotten away from that. We've wandered into the wrong path. But if we repent and call out to him, he will save us and, and guide us back onto the right path. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the steps of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on that law he meditates day and night. And so God provided the people his law to know the way to go and to know him. The sixth and final thing God provided for his people in the wilderness was sanctuary. He tells them to build a tabernacle, a traveling tent that they would put up and take down as they move along those 40 years. It'll be a place of worship. And God instructs them on how he is to be worshipped. They don't come up with, with this on their own, just like they didn't come up with the Ten Commandments on their own. God gives them his holy law and he gives them how he wants to be worshipped. He tells them... <laughs> of an altar where they're to bring sacrifices. He tells them of the bread and the incense and the lampstand. He tells them of the holy of holies and who alone is allowed back there. It's all in Exodus and Leviticus. They don't build their own church to God or come up with their own religion and holy book. God tells them how he will be worshipped. For he is the source and the center of our worship. Sometimes church today can be less about God and more about us. It's backwards. We can design worship around what we like and want and what fills our needs and what builds us up and makes us feel good and helps us reach our potential. But this isn't worship. Worship is all about Him, not us. He is the source and the center that we adjust to, 
not him adjust to our wishes. God instructs his people on how they are to worship him. And then he provides them sanctuary, a place to go and meet with him under his conditions. This is a good reminder. This is not our church. It belongs to the Lord. He is the head. And we are not here for a program that meets our needs. We are here to worship God and align our lives under him. We come to meet with him under his terms. Not just to fill our cup, but his. We come to praise him because he's worthy of our praise. We come to pray. We come to humbly listen, not to our own ideas, but his word and submit to it. We come not to create our own religion, but draw near to God the way he instructs us to draw near to him. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25 says, Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. The new and living way opened up for us through his body. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching, the day when he will return. We come to the Father, how? Through the blood of his Son, the only way in. We come washed in the waters of baptism. We come entering with thanksgiving in our heart. We come to worship, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. We come to serve. We come to confess our sins and pray for one another. We come to listen to his word and let it shape our life Monday to Friday. This is worship, his way. And not only can our busy schedules push, push worship from our lives, but if we're not careful, it can make worship not really worship at all, but more about us. We live to worship and glorify his name forever, to serve and to submit to him. And by his grace, he's made a way through Christ for us to know and meet with him. He gives us sanctuary instead of a tabernacle. We have the fellowship of believers and where two or more gather in his name, he is there and he invites us to come. You don't even just have to wait till Sunday. You can do that at any moment of any day. You gather together with a couple believers and, and have church, have worship, focus in on him, praise his name. So in the wilderness, our God provided us six things we're going to need to carry us through it. His presence. In a cloud of fire by day, or I mean cloud by day and a fire by night, we have his spirit. He gave them the daily bread and, and living water. We have his son. He gave them victory over their enemies as they lifted up Moses' arms in the wilderness. We have prayer and we have each other. He gave the law that would show us the way and, and also our need for him. And then he gave us sanctuary. How to worship and meet with him. Everything we need until we reach the promised land. God bless you this day.